prayer as we open up the service today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you have your way here today. We ask that you rule and reign and and have your way in, in all of our lives today. We thank you, Father, for eyes to see and ears to hear your truth. And as we welcome Robert today, Father, we just release the service to you. And we're grateful in everything that you want. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everybody. That's a good morning every morning when we come together and lift up his name. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 150, praise the Lord. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Just want to check here. Is everybody breathing here this morning? If not, we should get to praying or 911 or something like that. Probably both. Anyway, <laughs> I get silly sometimes. Every praise is for him.
Father, come and dwell. This is yours, a holy house of prayer, where the lost and the lonely bring their burdens and their cares. This is yours. This is your house. Come and dwell. We dedicate this temple to you, Lord. Let your glory fill this sanctuary. Be enthroned on the praises of your people. Lord, we agree. Come and dwell, this is yours, a holy house of prayer, where the lost and the lonely bring their burdens and their cares, this is your house, this is yours. praises of his people. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, and that you are not of your own, that you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Mystery of his plan For no eye 
So it's time to take our tithes and offerings. Um, let's just pray over this, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those things that you give to us and so generously provide in our lives. And now, Father, we bring back into your storehouse that which you have provided a portion for your work and your ministry. In your name, Jesus, we ask that you would bless these gifts and these tithes that are brought. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Were you wanting to do that um, song before? Yes. Holy Spirit, teach me today, comfort and guide me, show me the way, for the love of the Father, in the light of the sun. will be done. Lord, Holy Spirit, fill me, I pray. Seek me and show me when I go astray. The name of the Father in the name of the Son, in your name, Holy Spirit, God's will be done. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in your name, Holy Spirit, may God's will be done. Name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in your name, Holy Spirit, may God's will be done. Welcome to church, and uh, as you can see, we've got uh, a few guests up here. My name's Robert. I'm a member of a congregation here. Our pastor, Cindy, and her husband, uh, Mark, are off in Alberta today, and she's ministering today as well. I'd like us to pray over this service right now. We'll also hold her up in prayer. They're an hour ahead, so she's almost finishing probably. Father God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our pastor and for the ministry that you have set ahead of her. And Father, bless the ministry that she's involved in. And for this house, Father, we trust you and know that you and your will will be done here. And today, Father, I also pray that your word will accomplish that which you have and do desire it to accomplish. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Amen. I don't know why today seems a little more difficult for me. Do we have an echo going on? Are we able to fix that? Is it okay for you, everybody out there? Okay. Today's just, it seems when we talk about the Holy Spirit, people have all sorts of perspectives on that and on the person of the Holy Spirit. And I just want everybody to chill here because I'm not going anywhere extreme with this. But I am going to really bring something from my heart and the word that ministered to me over 30 years ago uh, that someone shared with me, even though I'd been a Christian for 12 years, I was, I was in a place, I don't know how many of you have been there as Christians, but especially as a new Christian, is there something going on, John? Okay. A little bit higher up. There we go. 
I'm not used to these. Thank you. Oh, close to the mouth. Okay, there we go. That's got it. Thank you. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on with what Pastor Cindy has been talking about for the past month or so, month and a half, and especially with Pastor George's, George Lucen's sermon from last week. And the part that really ministered to me when he was talking last week was where Jesus went off by himself to pray. And so as he went upwards, his inner man was strengthened so that he could go outwards. And so the inner man and our strength on the inside is what matters. And that's what I'm here to talk about. The work of the Holy Spirit. At the end of this message, I will pray a prayer and give you tools so that you'll be able to have instant access to the Holy Spirit and to the Spirit-filled life. Let's go to John 10.10 10, and just read what Jesus has to say about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I'm giving everybody time to get there. It's probably up behind me, isn't it? Not yet? Not yet? John 10.10 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So that's the promise that we know Jesus came, is once we get into relationship with him, he wants us to have an abundant life. Then we'll pop over to Acts 1.8, and this is just in refresher for a lot of us, especially if we've been doing the Immerse uh, studies. Jesus said, uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest parts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit is there to give us this power. We all know what happened with the disciples after the crucifixion of Jesus. About a week later, Jesus had to go find them. They'd gone back fishing. They didn't have the power. They didn't have the courage. We know what happened to Peter. We know how regretful he was of that experience. And that is an experience that people have when they're trying to live a life without the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus knows as our creator, how weak we are with what we have in this world and with our flesh. And so if we go to Ephesians 5.18, and this is really, I guess, the basis for um, where it comes from that we need to be filled with the Spirit. And Paul is writing here, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And I don't know how many people remember hearing this and understand what Paul is saying there, but he's saying be continually filled with the Spirit. Actually, the, I'm not a Greek scholar, <laughs> but my understanding of that word is to be being filled. So it's a continuous thing. It's not a one-time thing. You're not going to come to church and have someone pray over you and you're going to be filled with the Spirit and that's that. What happened when you became a Christian is the Holy Spirit came to live in you. And so the Holy Spirit is in you. The question is, how much of our life have we released to God so that His Spirit can actually strengthen us? So as I was saying at the beginning, my, to be honest, my Christian experience was a weak one for 12 years until I was about 22 years old. And what I'm going to share with you now is what changed my life at that point. And before we do that, I'm going to read Psalm 51.10. We used to sing this a lot. Do you remember this one? Create in me a clean heart. Psalm 
Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. That was, that was uh, David's prayer. And that was my experience. I constantly felt like I was in fear of God, like I was just on the edge of almost not being a Christian sometimes. And I didn't understand how to maintain this Christian life balance and to grow as I understood I was supposed to. Time and again, my friends and I would rededicate ourselves, our lives to the Lord. We would go to the front of the church. Things would build up in our lives, and we'd come, and we would say, God, we're sorry, and it would be a month or two or six months later. It would be summer camp, something like that, and we realized we would just feel convicted by the way our lives were. What happened was, again, I'm going to reach back about 36 years when I was with a group in the Amazon and someone shared with me and told me how God wanted me to have an actual relationship with him, not just a religious service to him. That God actually calls me his friend. That, that was a different thing because I always, my, my vision in my head was God's up there and I'm always trying to make things work right so that he'll be happy with me. But he's my friend. And he does, he's not just wanting me to live a perfect life. In fact, he knows that on my own I can't. At this point, the person took out, where is that? There was a little tract he had with him. I have it up here. So there it is took out this little tract, and you can find this now online, and it's called, How Have You Made the Wonderful Discovery of the Spirit-Filled Life? And we're going to go to my primary text today, which is 1 Corinthians. And it's chapter 3. Okay, and it's the end of the chapter. <coughs> Just let me get that straight, because I know it goes into verse 4. Okay, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. At verse 14 through to chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Another version will refer to as to carnal men. So, where are we with this? Okay, uh, Sarah, I'm going to get us to get the very first image, which is what a natural man looks like. The Bible outlines in this place here three types of people that are on this planet. We have natural man, which is a person who is living their own life, they're directing their own life, Christ is not in the life. Then Paul refers to the next slide, which is a spiritual person where Christ is on the throne of the life and we are in obedience and subject to Christ. 
as such, uh, things become organized in our lives. Well, what happens soon after salvation is we end up becoming carnal. And this is where Paul was having the problem with people, is he wanted to talk to them as spiritually mature, but instead, a lot of us take control of our lives back and kind of put Jesus on the side. I've heard people refer to this as having fire insurance. Like, yes, I accepted Jesus in my life. I'm not going to go to hell, but I'm going to take care of everything else in my life. I'm going to live how I want to live. That's not what it means to have Jesus as Lord of our lives. And it's also not that Jesus is a cruel taskmaster. So for me, the light went on. I was living as a carnal Christian. And it wasn't that I was saved and unsaved. It was that I was taking control of the throne of my life. And that is where I realized I don't need to wait. I don't need to wait until everything builds up in me and I feel conviction. But instead, it was introduced to me, it's kind of like breathing. So I want all the kids here, because I know we got kids, and all the adults, I want everybody to hold their breath. Do you need to breathe yet? I do. <laughs> okay, that's kind of how it feels when we hold in our uh, anticipation for and, and, and the conviction that the Holy Spirit is putting upon us is we hold in that relationship and, and it gets broken. Instead, we need to breathe. And we need to breathe spiritually. And so that is what the person shared with me. <clears throat> I'm getting ahead of myself. What I realized as well is that as I was living this life where I wasn't submitting to God, I became like what Paul said in Romans 7.24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the wretched man is that carnal man who, who knows he could do better, but the, the flesh is directing us in a way that we don't want to. But we need to grow so that we get into that spiritual place. Here are some of the things that a carnal man will experience. And their life is... Sorry, their life is characterized by a lot of these things. There's legalistic attitudes. Do we have that slide, Sarah? Okay, their legalistic attitudes will have impure thoughts, will have jealousy, will have fear, will have guilt. And we walk around with these things quite often discouraged. We're ignorant of our spiritual heritage. We have unbelief, we have disobedience, we have loss of love for God and for others, we have a poor prayer life, and quite often we have no desire for Bible study. So if you want to know, am I carnal or not, take a look at some of those things in our lives. Where, as a spiritual person, grows in the things of Christ. And this, is, this was the release that I had. For over 36 years now, I've been able to go from day to day, moment to moment, understanding, don't wait until the Spirit feels strong in a church service. When you know that you've stepped over the line or you've taken control of your life back, it's, it's, it's like that, to say, God, I'm sorry. I've sinned. I want you as king in my life. As I began to do this, I began to grow in faith. And I found that freedom that we hear people talk about in Christianity, but so often it feels like legalism. But I found freedom. I found freedom from discouragement, freedom from living a carnal life. 
Some of the things that you will experience when you live a spiritual life are everything you read about in the Bible. You'll have, find love, joy, peace. Do you recognize these things? What are they called? The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness. Other things that you're going to find is that your life is going to be Christ-centered, empowered by the Holy Spirit. You'll find opportunities to introduce others to Jesus. You're going to find an effective prayer life. The Word of God is going to become understandable. And why is that? Because the Holy Spirit, part of His, His activity in our life is He is our teacher. He's our guide. He's our teacher. He is the one who brings us closer to Jesus. I also found that my prayer life it changed as I began to say, Holy Spirit, take control of my life. From that moment on, of spiritual, after we're being spiritually born, the Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, as I said at the beginning. But we are to be filled, that is directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit, and we do this through faith. And you can receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit right now. And this is, this is what I'm saying. It's very simple. It's not a dangerous thing, except it does, the one thing that happens is your life becomes under the control of God. What you need to do to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit? You need to be sincere about your desire to be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, and you'll see this. Now, these are the words of um, John 37. Did I say? No, John 7, 37. There's not 37 chapters in John. John chapter 7. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Do you have that experience in your life? Yes. Praise God. What that is from, it's from the Holy Spirit. He's the one who brings that out of us. <clears throat> he who comes to me, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. When Jesus says he's going to do something and we ask, it's in line with his will and he will do it. We have to believe and do that. So what do we do? We confess our sins. By faith, we thank God that he has forgiven all of our sins, past, present, and future. And that's all because Christ died for us. Next, we present every area of our lives to Jesus. Romans 12, 1 to 2 talks about that as an acceptable offering to Jesus. And then by faith, we claim the fullness of the Holy Spirit according to Jesus' command that we are to be filled with the Spirit and Jesus' promise he will always answer when we pray according to his will. Let me talk about some of the things that I have seen happen when we are committed and fulfilled in walking a Spirit-filled life. I've seen this church. I, uh, when we arrived here about a year ago, it was like, my goodness, this small community of believers have a global reach with our, our um, I guess, audio video, but it's beyond that, with a social media reach on YouTube, on different 
channels. Exactly. And now, apparently, hundreds of people a week tune in. And that is something that the Holy Spirit placed on people's hearts, placed on people's hearts ages ago to begin to be trained so that when the opportunity showed up, they were ready to go. I was sharing with Terry that when we were doing mission work, uh, again, it was decades ago, but we used to hand out a flyer which would tell people, tonight at this soccer stadium or at this plaza, we're going to be showing a film on the life of Jesus. And the director of the whole enterprise that we were there in Brazil came and said, you know what? There's something wrong with this flyer. You see the back? It's blank. He says, we need to do something about that. A number of us got together, and what we ended up doing, we came up with four different flyers, four different colors. The first flyer had the steps to salvation. The second flyer had an assurance of salvation. The third one had how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what we're talking about here. The fourth one was how to grow in faith by becoming a part of a church. And then one of the guys said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make those different colors. And on the bottom it will say, this is one of four flyers. Find a neighbor who has a different colored flyer and it will have a different message on the back. Well, all of a sudden we had built-in follow-up. <laughs> and we have three or four people getting together to talk about Jesus. And I saw that as the Holy Spirit in action. That's what you will experience. Uh, Sarah, we don't have a slide up right now, but the one which has Christ in charge with the characteristics... There's holy inspiration that comes. And Brother Craig, you shared with me it's several months ago now, and it hasn't left me, so it's God who shared it through you to be, which was on, in, uh, on our imagination. And Paul talks about not having vain imaginations, worthless imaginations. But God did give us an imagination, right? And when... when Brother Craig shared it with me. It was like, I don't know why. I haven't seen this for 61 years in my life. When God came to Abraham, he said, Abraham, you're, you're going to have children as much as the sand of the sea. And look up at the stars. Well, Abraham had to use his imagination. He couldn't see all the sands of the sea. I'm sorry, Craig, but you had to break it down that simple to get into my head. I get it now. And all of a sudden, all the things in my life began to straighten out in my thinking in the last few months, re looking back and recognizing all the little miracles that God has done. And as we are... I can see, the la the, especially the last 36 years, there's a difference from the first 12 years of my life as a Christian where I was highs and lows, highs and lows sort of thing. But in the current way that God has done it, I just have felt it's been a constant up. It hasn't been. Uh, and if people, if you know that life where it's what they call two steps forwards and one step back, or sometimes two step and three step backwards, that's not the life God has called us to. We are called to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We are, what else? Name them, more than conquerors, overcomers through Jesus Christ. We are his ambassadors. We are here to bring the message to our fellow human beings who are currently in a natural state. And yes, that natural state, as Paul says, they will see what we believe is foolishness. But don't take that as judgment on yourself because you are not in that kingdom. Sarah, I gave you a, a little quote about Jesus of the king and having a kingdom. Uh, 
I'll read it here. A king has a kingdom, and to have a kingdom means you're not ruled by anyone else. So that's what Jesus calls what he came to establish was a kingdom. He's called us to come into it. Back in the day, few of us remember there were, we, the phrase was going around, we're king's kids. I don't know if any of you remember that one, but that is the truth. And the question is, are we acting like it? Or are we acting like we don't know how to be a king's kid? And the thing about Jesus is, not only is he the king of his kingdom, he is the king of kings. And so we are to come into relationship with him, not only to have fire insurance and save us from hell, but we are to come into relationship with him so that we can have an abundant life like he promised. The only way to do that is through the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to check myself on a second here because one thing that I felt God wanted me to say at the beginning, which I uh, passed over, was to say that to become a Christian is not a difficult thing either. What it takes is to understand that God loves you. He loves everyone. And he has a wonderful plan for each of our lives. And as George Lutzer was saying last week, this church is open to everyone. And... The, the thing that was on my heart at that time, I've heard it from other pastors, is that if you think there's someone on this planet who's not deserving of God's love, you think there's something in you that's somehow not sinful, that God chose you. We all have that blemish of sin on us. We all need the salvation of Jesus Christ. There's nothing special about myself over someone else. And so, we are, number one, loved by God. Number two is, we're in a lot of trouble because sin has separated us from God. And there is no way for us to get there, across that, on our own efforts. And that's why Jesus came and died on the cross as a sacrificial lamb that through him we have access to the kingdom. A lot of us, and that's me, I'm not going to even go us. Maybe I'm the only one who took that long to learn how to live a spiritual life and not be a person that Paul was saying... I'm kind of, you can almost hear Paul saying, I'm kind of fed up, like, I've worked with you so hard. Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of flesh, as carnal, as infants in Christ. And that's because we hadn't learned how to live in relationship. And the simple prayer that God taught me through, these, through this person who shared this with me. I'm just going to share it with you. And then at, at different points in your life, you're going to be praying something similar. This is, I know when we give out prayers like this, like the prayer of salvation and so forth, I've heard someone call them training wheel prayers. They're not intended, there's no special power in exactly how these words are said. Okay, it is the concepts that's within the prayer. So, dear Father, I need you. I acknowledge that I have been directing my own life and that as a result, I have sinned against you. 
I thank you that you have forgiven my sins through Christ's death on the cross for me. How many recognize that as being very similar to the sinner's prayer? But what we're doing now is in faith, we're accepting that as we are stepping off of the throne of our life as a Christian and, put, and, and re putting Christ back on the throne. I now invite Christ to again take his place on the throne of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit as you commanded me to be filled and as you promised in your word that you would do it if I asked in faith. I pray this in the name of Jesus and as an expression of my faith, I'll now thank you for directing my life and for filling me with the Holy Spirit. See, it's not whether the Holy Spirit is there or not. The Holy Spirit is residing in us. The question is, are we giving the Holy Spirit authority to work in our lives? And as soon as I did that and gave the Holy Spirit that authority, and I don't mean just on Sundays, I mean like multiple times through the day, moment to moment. Um, there's a book by a brother Lawrence called Practicing the Presence of God. And he was a monk from the 16, 1500, something like that. But um, the concept, it's a, it's a small book and it seems dense and everything like that, but that's exactly what it is. It's just moment by moment when the Holy Spirit kind of puts a little pin, a little thing in us and goes, should you have been thinking that? Was that a jealous thought that you had? Are you struggling with whatever it is? Are you struggling with the fact someone else has something that you don't? Are you struggling with the fact that, well, Paul talked about it, you know, uh, don't be drunk. Are, you, are, are we struggling with alcohol? Some of these repetitive sins, the Holy Spirit just says, I'm going to change you from glory to glory. For some people, it's a full release really quickly, but for others of us, it is moment by moment. And as we give that moment to God, we get stronger. And we say, okay, I'll put that drink down. I'll put whatever it is down that is, that you're telling me God is a difficulty for me. I will come under your control. And as we do that, that little bit over a week, a month, a half year, a year, all of a sudden, like they say, a boat that changes just half a degree in a period of time will be way off target. As we have been way off target, as we change just a little bit on a regular basis, all of a sudden we come into that line with God. And I do like that phrase, spiritual breathing. Don't hold it in. That when, when the Holy Spirit is telling you, I want to work on that with you. Do it now. So, have you guys been noticing you're breathing since we held our breaths? I'm guessing not. It's just one of those automatic things that happens in our lives. And that's essentially what's going to happen as you become sensitive to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. He's not going to say, give me all your money and go live wherever. You know, he's going to slowly bring you into that place. He will always provide more than he takes from you. Um, you hand over that, that mind of guilt or that, that position of guilt and fear of God. And all of a sudden you walk into a place where you're walking in love with God and in trust that he has everything under control. So, I'm going to um, finish off here. When you walk in the Spirit, 
your life is going to demonstrate more and more the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you want to look those up, that's in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We already talked about them, right? Love, joy, peace. Let me see if I can find them. I don't, I, why don't we remember these, right? I'm, I'm, I'm watching and I'm saying you already know. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, and goodness. <clears throat> I was looking at Sandy because she teaches Sunday school, and I bet you the kids all knew this as well. <laughs> and as we do this, we will become more and more conformed to the image of Christ. And that's really what it comes down to. It's, it's a process. We're in process. And I encourage you as maybe... Everyone here already knows this. It's something that I wasn't aware of until, as I say, 36 years ago. It's proved in my life to be positive. I, I'm proof of that. Um, you, I've given some of my testimony when I was 12 or 13 is when I accepted Christ. And as I say, it was a struggle through those teen years into university years into my first years at work. I got to tell you about this lady that I met and where God changed, uh, uh, yeah, we got a minute or two, changed my perspective and recognizing that God works all over the place in all sorts of churches. Her name is May Guttridge. Well, was she passed away a number of years ago. And she uh, worked with, uh, started a, something in Vancouver called St. James Social Services. And she started this because she got up at four in the morning and prayed and spent three hours, two to three hours, she told me, in prayer. I had the privilege of living in a garden shed, uh, a garden house behind where uh, her main house was. And she told me that while she was praying, God told her, that he wanted her to minister to the poor in East Vancouver. And she goes, I have to tell you, I go to a church that is more uh, religious than most churches. They actually, the, that church has a, has a thing that flies back and forth that has incense in it. And she says, I don't know if you could make it, if you'd make it through a service, but I'd like you to come. And so I did. And what she did for people there, what God did through her, it's the first place that had an AIDS hospice in Canada, or in BC, I don't know about Canada, but in BC. She had a women's shelter there. Um, she worked with people who just struggled in life. And she had this, the spirit told her to go and <clears throat> Go and talk to the government. And a woman named Grace McCarthy was there in charge of something to do with the, I'm not sure, finances or something. And she said, would it be okay if we, as a small society, if you gave us oversight over these people's monies because that they got on welfare, you know what happens is they get this check and within 24 to 48 hours, some of them no longer have the check. They don't have a place to live. They don't have food. So if you give us authority to look after this, we will have their housing paid for. We'll put money into restaurants they go to. And that person will know that the person who comes in is allowed to eat one, two, or three meals a day here, that they have the money for that. We'll also ch have them check in with us. And so, depending on how, how needy they were, it was like a, almost like a doctor's office. There was a center area with chairs, four offices on the side with social workers. And they would come in, and quite often we'd, they'd come in just for $5 that they had in their account. And I was working with this guy named Ned. Sorry, Ned, I don't remember your last name. B 
big guy. He rode his bike to, to, to work. And he would have someone come in. We'd have a roster and they'd come in. Their name would be called. And we would talk with them, spend five, ten minutes, whatever they needed, help them, ask them if they're taking their meds, different things like that. And then he'd say thank you and he'd say, you know, you can leave and close the door when you're done. And me being this university student, all this stuff, I was going, oh, I see what you're doing, Ned. You're, you're pacing yourself. And he goes, no. I'm saying a Jesus prayer for them. Every one of them is getting prayed for today. That's why I needed to learn about walking in the Spirit. I didn't see that. I didn't see. That's what happens when you're walking in the Spirit. You see ministry opportunities and you take them in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask us to pray now. And after this, Brother Craig, uh, let's see what's the order of service. I know you're going to come and give us communion at some point. Here we are. Uh, first, we're going to have a song, and then uh, Craig will come and do communion. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that you are a loving God. I thank you that you are a God who desires all men to be saved and none to perish. I pray, Father, that you would use us through our prayer life, through those things we do in life actively with people to encourage people, to give them hope. And Father, where you can use us to pray for people who are struggling, we ask that you would, your spirit would rise up within us and that we would take those opportunities and not just walk by them, not be a person who walks by a, a fellow human who's struggling. And Father, I pray that we would learn to breathe spiritually. That as we go through our days, we would confess on a regular basis, Father, I'm sorry that I stepped out of your kingship and I took control in a certain area in my life. I ask you, Father, to take control again. And I thank you that you do. It's as simple as that to be filled with the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, there is therefore now non, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is not a message about in any way is intended for condemnation. It's intended for exhortation and growth. And so that is what the Holy Spirit is here to do with us, is to help us grow. Thank you, Father. For giving me this word, I feel like the prophet who said, with stum stammering lips and a stuttering tongue, I brought your message. But I pray that it would minister life where it needs to be ministered. In your name, Jesus, I thank you for this, and I exhort my brothers and sisters now to live a spirit-filled life. Amen. Amen. Brother Terry, I love you, man. You bring the music. I almost didn't have to preach after that song. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.
Well, if I may, I'm going to go off script with this one and, and switch that last song uh, to a song, and you know, we don't need the, the projector for this one because everybody knows this song. I've heard it in dozens of different representations. Here's another one for you. This little light of mine. You are, a li you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel but on a stand, and it gives light to all those in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, the first time I heard this song was probably way back in, in Sunday school, probably at least 10 years back. Anybody buying that? No. <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, I know you all know the, the, the lyrics to this one, so let's go. Let our light shine. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine Let it shine Let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. We're gonna let it shine till Jesus comes. Let it shine till Jesus comes. Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, hide it under a bushel, no, hide it under a bushel, no, Where let it shine, hide it under a bushel, ah, we're gonna let it shine, hide it under a bushel, no, we're gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, we're gonna let it shine all over the world, we're gonna let it shine all over Castle Bar. Gonna let it shine all over the Kootenays, east and west. We're gonna let it shine. We're gonna let it shine all over the world. We're gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Cause this be the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine 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 One more Let it shine Thanks to Craig, too. We've never played before together, so <laughs> he did a bang-up job. Praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's communion time. I just want to read Leviticus 11, um, 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul, for it is the blood that make it atonement for the soul. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I will read in from 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat, sorry, I will start from, I will start from 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth uh, and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Praise the Lord. Today, as we take part of the Lord's Supper, we're just going to examine ourselves before because there's benefit in the blood in this communion but to get the full benefit in this in the communion first we have to examine ourselves the bible says search our heart so it's, you know as we because the bible says judgment start in the house of god and we are the church in the church so as we search ourselves and look into ourselves and if anything there be that we need to pray about, confess, that you, we can inherit, we can have the blessing of the Holy Communion today. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So let us take a time and let's bow our head and pray each individual. Let's search ourselves, let's search our heart so we can not leave the same way we come, but we can have the blessing of this Holy Communion. Praise God. Hallelujah. When you finish, you could just say amen. Amen. Praise God. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. As we take and eat, is to do this as remembrance that he will he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Remember that he has paid a price for us. As we take and eat, let's partake of the body. Amen. So this is the cup of the New Testament. As we do likewise, in oft, uh, often to remember of him. Praise God. Let us drink. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your broken body and your precious blood. Amen.
Father, I thank you that we can uh, come before you. Thank you for Craig. Thank you for his family. And Father, you know the direction this church is to take. And Father, we commit the ways of this fellowship unto you, Father. Father, we do it in victory, knowing that it's a victorious future that's ahead of us, that we are going to be more than overcomers in Castlegar for your name's sake. Can you bless the people as they are about to leave? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, as a priest, almighty God, I stretch out my hands towards the congregation and those who are in um, watching online, Father God, wherever they be, Father, I pray that you touch each and every individual life, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray, mighty God, that whatever they're struggling, whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, whatever, almighty oh God, wherever they're feeling, any form of pain, any form of, almighty oh God, tormenting their flesh. Father, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke it right now in Amen. Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that it's peace in their heart, in their mind. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Almighty God, I pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, I speak the blessing over their life that they be blessed. So, Father God, in Jesus' name. Yes. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus for this church, this, this church, oh God. Father, I pray, Almighty God, that Father Church, Almighty God, Almighty God, there's a light in this community. And I pray, Father God, Oh, Father God, that it will continue to shine brighter than ever before. Let each cheers, I speak over these empty chairs, Father God, let it be full, Almighty yes. God. I pray, yes, Father, Father God, let Almighty God, these chairs be full of people, Almighty God, that desire to serve you, Almighty God. Yes. I pray for the community, Father God, in Jesus' name. Almighty God, I rebuke any, any curse over the community, Father God. That causing the people them not to have a desire to seek you, not a desire to serve you, to know you, Father. Father, I pray, mighty God, so many churches in the community, but yes, they, they, they are empty. Yeah. The young men, the young women, oh, mighty God, the girls, oh, God, they now have no desire. They, it's not for, a lot of them doesn't know who is Jesus. But, Father God, we pray, mighty God, that you turn things around, Father God. A mighty revival in this community, mighty God. Let the churches be full. Let the name of Jesus be exalted and lifted up. Oh, Father God, in this community, mighty God. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. And everyone who's going, going out, oh God, going home their own separate way, I pray, oh God, for safety and protection, Father God, in Jesus' name. Father God, I've covered them, oh Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And I thank you for the word, oh God, that preached today, oh God. That, uh, oh God, each of every one of us, oh God, apply to our heart, oh God. That we, oh God, deny ourselves and let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, almighty oh God. Because Jesus said, I of myself cannot do nothing, almighty oh God. We pray, Father God, a blessed speaker, God, in Jesus' name. Father God, I pray, I thank you, oh Father. And the pastors, oh Father, wherever they are, may they come back safely and peacefully, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, brother. So just before everybody leaves, uh, this is a house of prayer. And so if people would like prayer, um, absolutely come forward. We have people who will pray with you. Uh, there's also coffee and so forth downstairs to continue fellowshipping with each other. Uh, be blessed. Thank you.